patriotism. It's a good word, isn't it? It's a word you like. It's a word I like. What is it? More importantly than what it is, why does it matter? Why is it important? Well, first of all, let's acknowledge our current situation in this country. Let's, before we get to why it matters, let's acknowledge the situation. It's going away. We know that in survey after survey after survey after survey, Americans are less patriotic. You see the numbers right there. 1998, 70% all the way down to 38 in this year and dropping, dropping and dropping quickly. Okay, why is it dropping? Well, it's important, before we get to why it matters, it's important to understand it's not dropping for no reason. No one can figure it out. It's dropping because there's a very, very focused effort, an extremely focused effort by Democrats, the education system, Hollywood, entertainment, every cultural institution now is actually focusing on crapping on America and taking patriotism away. Don't believe me? Here's a few examples. Here's Cuomo. We're not going to make America great again. It was never that great. <laughs> we have not reached greatness. We will reach greatness when every American is fully engaged. Of course. It was never great. Of course. Don't think that was some kind of a one-off. Raphael Warnock, because shoot, the whole show could have been about him. He's got a doozy here. I don't, no matter what happens next month, more than a third of the nation that would go along with this is reason to be afraid. America needs to repent for its worship of whiteness on, on full display. Repent for the worship of whiteness. Of course, it's not just the governor. It's not just the senator. The president of the United States of America used his State of the Union address to crap on the place. We've all seen the knee of injustice on the neck of black Americans. Now's our opportunity to make some real progress. And it's not just politicians. As I mentioned, it's entertainment. And it's not just entertainment. It's entertainment for children, the real reason patriotism is dropping is because they're going after children. Here's a little excerpt from the show Proud Family. This country was built on slavery, which means slaves built this country. Tilled this land from sea to sea to sea. First it was rice, tobacco, sugar cane. Then Whitney did his thing and cotton became king. And we were its soldiers. Four, Four million, million strong. strong. Fighting for America's freedoms, even though we remained America's slaves. slaves. Built this country. The descendants of slaves continue to build this. Slaves, slaves built, built this country. Yeah, you get the idea. Now... There's a focused effort to destroy patriotism. They want to burn the country down. You, you probably read about this in the Anti-Communist Manifesto that's available at jessekellybook.com, but you, you don't want them to burn the country down. And that's a problem. You see, the people have to agree that the country sucks. And so what you do is you start hammering on them over and over and over and over again, telling them all about how bad the place is and America's evil and America's racist and America's never been great and America's never been this. And if you can get that message beaten into the heads of enough people out there, which they are clearly succeeding in doing, eventually those people will not just step aside while you burn it down. They might help you light the match. But why does patriotism matter? Why is this such a disaster? Well, we've used this example before, but it, it's easy for me to understand, so that's why I use the example. I want you to picture something. Set America aside. Forget about America for a few minutes. I want you to picture you and me. We live in a village. There's 100 people in this village, all right? And this is a village in Africa, all right? So we're a village in Africa. What do we do? We have cattle. We obviously grow some crops so we can eat. You know, we have our little huts and whatnot. And we have a village. It's our community. It's our society. Now picture this. There's 100 people in the village. And let's say 80, 90 of those people, they love it. They appreciate it. They like the village. 
They appreciate the community. They appreciate the values. They're happy there. They, they love their history. We've got a great history in our little village. And so what happens when you have a high percentage of your village that loves the village? Well, everything is better. More people, better people will participate in the governing of the village. You'll get more people who will volunteer to work with the children of the village. And when they work with the children of the village, they will explain to those children how wonderful the village is and how blessed those kids are to live in that village. When we have a village full of patriotic people, when you walk by the uh, cattle pen where we keep the cows and you see a fence post is broken, well, oh no, it's our village, it's, it's, it's our cows. We get, I love this village, hang on, let me, let me stop what I'm doing. Let me repair the fence post. Oh, hey, we need extra water? I volunteer, love my village, I'll go get some water. You see what I mean? Now, 80, 90 people working like that will make the village better and stronger because they love it. And that's why patriotism matters for that village. But let's go the opposite way. Where are we at now in America? 38%? 38% patriotism? So let's take that to the village. Most of the people, or the majority, I should say, of the, of the village, over 60%, I don't like it. I don't think it's special. In fact, they think it kind of sucks. The village has got all kinds of racism in its history. It's never been equal. It's kind of ugly. It's just not a place that they enjoy. They don't even like the values of the village. These people and their old fashioned values. So now, when you have a village like that and you walk by that fence post with the cattle, the fence post doesn't get fixed, does it? You look at that fence post, not only do you shrug your shoulders and say, it's not my problem, you might kick down another post or two. After all, the village sucks, doesn't it? Oh, we need more water? <laughs> Sounds like a personal problem. I'm not thirsty. Someone needs to help out the children, guide the children? <laughs> Why would I guide children in this garbage village? Now, over time, what would that do to the village? It would destroy it. Patriotism is not a weird thing. It's not something we should roll our eyes about. It's not some dumb cliche. Patriotism is everything. It is critical for the country. And it's something that should be pushed by all of our cultural institutions. Your cultural institutions should be focused on making patriotic Americans. And this makes people, even some people on the right, uncomfortable when they talk about something like school. I just want them to learn reading and writing and arithmetic. No, I want them to learn about America and how wonderful America is and America's values and the values of freedom. I want them to learn about God in school, family. These things should be being pushed by every cultural institution from the schools to the movies to the president to politicians of both parties. It should be the norm to talk about America's greatness. But we don't have that. And because we don't have that, we are feeding people, not just young people, all people, we are feeding people in this country ugliness, and it's destroying us. You do remember when St. George Floyd died, right? It wasn't just the St. George Floyd death, that wasn't really what hit me. What hit me was how widespread the America Sucks protests went after that. I'm not just talking about professional athletes catching a knee, I mean, in city after city after city after city, you saw legions of people who agreed, yeah, this place does suck. Let's burn it down. The lack of patriotism hit me then harder than it ever has. It opened my eyes, and it's a big deal, and it's something we need to reverse. We have to start at home with that. Remember, we have to start with our own kids in our own house, and we focus on our community, our town, and Lord willing, we'll save the country, all right? All right, we got Dave Raboy next. He talks about us being a late stage republic. What's he mean by that? Does patriotism or lack thereof have something to do with that? We'll ask Dave next. Joining me now, my friend Dave Raboy, he, uh, he's the one who coined the phrase late stage republic, or at least he's the one who I got it from. 
and he has an outstanding substack. Dave, okay, patriotism is not a small thing. I know a lot of people roll their eyes at it. It sounds kind of hokey. Oh, gosh, patriotism. But it, it's, it's critical for a nation, and losing it is part of the reason we're losing this place, isn't it? Um, yeah, I agree with you completely. Um, I think the, the impulse to be patriotic, to love one's own, is something that's uh, deeply human, and it's also something that uh, is, is, you know, because it's deeply human, it's not going anywhere. And, um, and we are in, I mean, unfortunately, we're in a really bad situation, as, as uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, 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 you say every day, which is that, um, you know, in order for this country to, to remain to be lovable um, by a lot of Americans, um, it needs to adhere to you know something that um, you know something that that appeals to uh, to, to the vast, vast majority of the people. Now, I mean, I'm in the in the position where I just say, look, um, I'm not even going to argue about you know the left's idea or the left's conception of what is the good. Um, we have another one. Uh, we can we can argue about it all day long. Obviously, I have my you know my preferences. You have your preferences, but at the end of the day, we need to. The most important thing I think is to recognize that these are really two totally competing systems. You just saw it today with the um, uh, with the affirmative action ruling. Um, folks who are coming at it from I mean, there's there's no middle ground really. The f folks who are coming at it uh, from left and right have two completely opposite. Uh, non-compatible ideas of what justice means and you know that's that's where we are that's the big picture and if um and and i mean patriotism is is important and we all kind of you know lament the fact that um um you know lament the fact that that we don't have it and i think the larger thing is the reason why we lament it is not because we feel you know a, a sort of kind of vague vague you know patriotism like hey i would love for it to come back the same way that we were patriotic you know when we grew up and things were good and all that i mean that's that's true but that's on the surface but underneath all that is um is is the idea that um we know that a nation cannot survive if its people don't want to fight for it don't love it um don't uh don't respect it and um you know we're in a we're in a place where um, that is getting hollowed out from the left and from the right, frankly. Dave, I, I want to actually ask about this. I'm glad you brought this up because let's, let's take a different angle on it from the right angle because we have always been the patriotic ones. It's no, it's no mystery. Democrats have hated this country for a very, very, very long time. Now they really, really loathe the place. You see an American flag flying at someone's home. That's not a Democrat's home. Just, I'm sorry, I've knocked on doors. It's just true. A Democrat doesn't live there because they don't fly the flag. But as we turn into a country, I call it the U.S. of gay, just tongue in cheek, but as we turn into a country that is very, very different and our government has values that are not mine, they're not yours, our culture has values that are not mine, they're not yours, our education system, Hollywood. As we turn into a place that you and I probably don't love as much, does that mean we're no longer patriotic? Are we a different kind of patriotic? Patriotic? What does it mean for us, Dave? Well, there's no answer to the question that says, well, that means that um, you know that means that we're, we just lose our impulse for patriotism, especially for for those of us who are on the right. That's not going away. We're always going to love one's own. We're always going to want the best for one's own. Um, it's just a matter then of how you define it. So um, I mean, I've said for a long time that the old sense of patriotism that many of us had for America should be transmutated into, Florida or Texas or, um, you know, or the red states that we live in. And I know you say this all the time, as, as do I, you know, get yourselves packed up if you live in a blue state and move to be around people, um, you know, who, who you would, um, you know, you would like to fight alongside as opposed to fight with. And um, I, I mean, I, I don't say that for, um, I mean, I say that about, about anyone living in any country. 
wouldn't you want to do that? Doesn't that make more sense to you? And um, and replacing, you know, our old conception of America with, let's say, I mean, in my case, Florida is the place that I think of. You know, Florida has all the attributes that I think of um, when I think about my patriotism for, uh, you know, for kind of the old United States or Red America. And that's just where we need to go as as um, where we need to go as a as a country because as I said we're not losing this impulse to uh, you know to to want to um, you know love the people who you know we agree with who we we identify with as one people. Dave, how did it drop so quickly? I I, I read a little poll, a little chart at the very beginning of the show, nineteen ninety eight. 70% of Americans said patriotism is very important to them. Just fast forwarding to this year, that's down to 38. That's a very rapid drop in just 20 years. 20 years is not a lot of time. That's, that's nothing. That's a snap of a finger, and that's significant. How did that happen so fast? Well, it's, it's the polarization. You know, it's, um, it, it's the fact that people are realizing that yes, we we do indeed have two completely contradictory, mutually exclusive, um, you know, sets of values or let's say understandings of justice and and of the world and what we want from government and what we want from each other and increasingly, you know, the way, even the way we see reality, you know, are men men, are women women, uh, you know, things like that, which are, which were truths that used to be kind of outside of politics that we would all agree on so once we agree with once we agree on nothing it becomes very hard to sustain um a sense of patriotism um and uh you know that's that's where we are i mean i think it's so low because you just had four years of donald trump so you had let you had the left saying no this is not my idea of america and now you've got um you know three years of biden so you have the right saying no this is not my idea of america so i mean the the long and the short of it is it's only going to get worse okay i, I don't disagree that sucks but i don't disagree so can we get it back? Is that even something that's possible? Because it doesn't sound to me like you think it's possible. And I'll be honest, I, I, I agree with you. I don't know that it's possible. Is it possible? Um, I don't know if it's I mean, <laughs> I don't think it's possible. I think it's a, it's a fool's errand. It would require us to wake up one day and all of us believe the same things and, you know, half the country to lobotomize itself. And, uh, and 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 give up the things that it holds dear, the way it understands the world, and that's just not going to happen. Um, I often think, and and I'm sure we've even spoken about, had 9/11 happened, um, you know, yesterday or today, what would happen? You know, the country would not come together; it would actually come apart. Why? Because we would have, um, you know, more than just more than just having um, being at each other's throats we would also have two very completely different opposite readings of what just happened and who is culpable and what is, you know, what is going on. Um, and um, that doesn't, you know, that, that doesn't produce harmony um, at the, at the snap of a finger. And I don't even think harmony, I don't even think that kind of harmony can be coaxed, um, you know, from, from inside or from without. Can a nation of this size even have harmony, or is that just not something that's really possible, Dave? And I realize that we've been this size for quite some time, but we haven't had this many people for quite some time. Are we just, are we too big to be that tight-knit little village? I think so. I think the, the uh, I think it's very difficult, or, or I would say impossible, for a large multi-ethnic empire based on political ideology to long sustain itself when it comes to um you know when it when it comes to to the, d the direction it's going i mean the nature of people say america is an idea I'm like okay that's fine what happens when people no longer believe in the idea or half the people believe in a derivation of the idea or that i our understandings of that idea change over time 
um, it's very obvious to me what happens, which is that you have societal um, disillusion because at the end of the day, political ideology will come and go, it'll mutate, it'll go here and there. And, um, and we are just too big and we were always too big. I think it was, I think it was, um, I think it was hubristic to expand to the size that, uh, that we are and then kind of inevitably allow our, our, our population to change the way it has through immigration, for example. And, um, you know, but, but, but it, you know, you can't only just blame immigration. You have to say, well, okay, you have to recognize that, um, that things have been going in a leftist direction for a long time regardless. And maybe it was inevitable that uh, our conceptions of, let's say, the founding documents have changed uh, or will or will have changed. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with your central uh, premise, which is that this was probably always in the cards. Sadly. Yeah. Sadly. His substack is late republic nonsense. It's freaking outstanding, as you can imagine. Dave, thank you, my brother. Thanks, buddy. All right. We got more? Not a lot more. We're going to talk about education stuff. What's really in the education? We still have final thoughts. We had more. We'll be back. Talk about the military angle of all this with my friend Sean Parnell. He is the host of the Battleground podcast, which you can now watch on Rumble, and I'm proud of him. Sean, okay, we're talking tonight about patriotism and the patriotism problem we have. And here's something that really hits me hard, and I'm sure you've experienced this. So many of the guys that I know who are veterans, they now tell me repeatedly they do not want their kids joining the military. That it is. I've never seen that in my entire life. It's never been that way. But there, some of them have flat out banned them. They said, "No, you will not join," and that sucks. Yeah, it does. In fact, Jesse, to your point, the Pentagon did a study about this, and they found. Oh, they, really? What they were looking for is they were trying to dive into the demographic or the type of person that would join the military. And what they found almost universally is that the military is a legacy organization. You know, men and women in this country serve this country because their father or grandfather or grandmother served before them. And so this is the first time, one of the first times in American history where people like us who were a part of 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, in other places, by the way, we're saying, you know, no, I'm not doing it anymore. And I thought I just talked about this the other day, Jesse, where you look back after 9-11 happened because I joined the military after September 11th. And after that happened, I mean, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, by and large, a time of peace in this country. And I remember having a, a conversation with my buddies, you know, in college thinking like we, our generation hasn't had a moment where we could rise up and serve something greater than themselves, 9-11 happened. And when it happened, man, I was like, the day after, I was like, uh, send me to Afghanistan, put me on the front lines, I wanna kill Osama bin Laden. And then a few months later, it's like Saddam had weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And you know what, I was like, let's, go, let's get into Iraq and let's take out Saddam too. I believed everything that the government told me. And looking back at 20 years later, right? And seeing how the government, you know, reacted to COVID and they lied about masks and vaccines and lockdowns and their effectiveness. And really seeing how we pulled out of Afghanistan and, and the disastrous surrender that happened there and the void that we created in Iraq, it's just one lie after the next in our government. I don't trust the government anymore. And I think most people who put their life on the line for this country or saw their friends die. I mean, I, I have you ever thought about this, Jesse? Actually, I don't have to ask that question. I know you have, but I've lost 30 friends in support of this war and these wars. And so now I've got five kids, you know, three of which are teenage girls, and all of them are asking me about my service and was it worth it? And should they serve? Or what branch should they serve? And almost universally, I mean, obviously it's their choice and I'll support them any way that they want to go, Jesse, but I tell them no. I tell them no, it's not the right time. 
Man, that that hit home there because I was it was actually two or three nights ago. I was texting back and forth with a Marine that I served with in Iraq, and he had kept a document. He keeps a document on his phone with a list of all the names of the guys from my unit who died. And he sent it over to me. And, you know, it's not like I'd forgotten, but you go through and you read that list and you remember this about this guy and you remember this about that guy. And it was yesterday. We were watching uh, Band of Brothers with my sons. My uh, the wife and I were sitting around watching Band of Brothers. I'm showing it to him for the first time. And my oldest asked, he really asked, hey, d- Dad, what about, what about joining? And you could tell he was, he was brewing on it as, always, as he was watching these heroes. What about the military? What about joining? Should, is, that, is that something I should do? And just without hesitation, Sean, I just looked at him and said, no, son, not this, not this military. No, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And I'd... Pff, I don't know how I feel about that, but that's what I told him. I I totally get it. And your story of Band of Brothers resonates with me. We have a family tradition where we watch Band of Brothers the day after Christmas, and we it's our job to finish it before New Year's. We I've done it every year since college. Now my kids are doing it because, you know, they're old enough to watch. And it's really important history, you know? My oldest son, yeah. he's 14 years old now. So, it, it, you know, people are talking about and saber rattling over Ukraine and potential escalations there. Well, I have a 14-year-old who's going to be 18 in four years. If people got their way, and I'm talking Democrats and Republicans, he could find themselves on the front line of the fight in Ukraine in a war against a a conventional nation, the likes of which this country has not anticipated what a war with Russia or some of Russia's allies would look like. But that notwithstanding, he asked me because he he was watching some of the episodes of my podcast where I'll have some of my guys back on. And I I was in the infantry. Um, I think you were in the infantry as well on the front lines of a lot Mm -hmm. of these fights. And he asked me straight up, Dad, like, I saw, I read in your bio, and I saw you talking with one of your soldiers. Did you did you really kill 350 terrorists in Afghanistan? And I said, Ethan, you know, don't I don't know that I couldn't fault him for asking the question, you know, because he was watching me discuss this with my troops. But yeah, the answer is yeah, and I don't regret. I don't lose a wink of sleep over over killing America's enemies, people that don't deserve that do terrible things to innocent people. I, but. I don't want him to have to go through that. In fact, I remember saying to myself, and man, Jesse, it was so naive back then, that I'm serving today so that my kids won't have to do the same thing someday. And not only was that naive, I realized that history repeats itself time after time again. I mean, we clearly didn't learn our our lesson after the Vietnam War, after spending eight years, 58,000 dead in Vietnam, and then 20 years at war in Iraq and Afghanistan. and have you ever asked yourself, what do we have to show for it? Like, I'm proud of my service, Jesse. Yeah. I would do it again in a second. If America ever found herself at risk, our borders at risk, I would I would volunteer to serve this nation in a second. But if you're going to ask me of whether Iraq and Afghanistan was worth it after I lost 30 of my closest friends, I'm going to tell you every single time, absolutely, positively, hell no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. And I'll tell you something else. Speaking of the military, uh, this this little this little clip of Secretary Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin just it, and I'm telling you what here it is. And today we reaffirm that transgender rights are human rights, and that America is safer and better when every qualified citizen can serve with pride and dignity. Sean, they, t- they complain about recruitment, but as much as the wasteful wars as you brought up, this is hurting recruitment too. Young men, young type A men who want danger and adventure and service and make themselves better, they don't want to join this military. It's not just people like me talking my sons out of it. That uh, high school wrestler in Iowa who wanted to be a Marine, he doesn't want to be a Rainbow Marine, and he's going to go do something else, man. I... I couldn't agree more. And Secretary of Defense Austin, by the way, he was a commanding general of the 10th Mountain Division when I was there and in Afghanistan. We we had n- nothing but positive things to say about him then. But now clearly he seems like he's just more concerned with the suits than the boots, uh, which is typically the case with generals as they progress through the ranks. But it, I, I cannot stand, it, it, it's a pet peeve of mine where you get these politicians that trot out stock platitudes like, our diversity is our strength. That's that's nonsense because it's only part of the story. And I know that you understand this, but when we were in Afghanistan and your boots on the ground front towards enemy, you don't care about someone's skin color, race, creed, religion. You don't 
care. The only thing that matters is that you're American. There are no hyphenated Americans on the battlefield. We don't celebrate people's differences in the military. So when you say our diversity is our strength, it's it's not true. The strength, one of the greatest strengths of this country is and always has been our ability to unify beyond our many differences, which is why in school, I mean, which back in the day, they taught you to critically think and think for yourself and question everything. But back in the day, it was America was a melting pot, not because people came here and discarded their culture and everything that was unique about them was because they retained those things, but put being an American first. And, and that's lost in society today because 25% of the radical left, who are all, by the way, are communists, they, they, they divide us between race, creed, religion, young, old, rich, poor, whatever, and they divide us so that they can keep us weak. And that's just, that's just the bottom yeah. line to it, and I hate to see it. That's true. Sean Parnell, love you, brother. We'll talk again soon. All right, see you, brother. Take care. Don't worry. We're not done. We got more. Hang on. Let's talk about schools. Let's talk about what they're doing with the kids because that, honestly, it's the most essential item when you're coming up with a patriotism problem. When you see, I should say, a patriotism problem starting in schools and starting with their programming, starting with their education. Joining me now, Robin Steenman. She is with the Williamson County, Tennessee chapter of the wonderful Moms for Liberty. Robin, they after, they're after kids, and they're after them on purpose, aren't they? It's not just an accident that they end up stumbling into all kids' things, from school to their movies. Not by accident at all. If you look at the history of Marxist cultural revolutions, the most effective ones are the ones that targeted children, especially through education. What kind of things are they teaching in school? Well, <laughs> there, it's a multi-pronged approach, really. It's not just the curriculum. It's social-emotional learning. It's restorative justice. It's comprehensive sexuality education. It's pornographic content in the libraries. It's gender ideology. It's generative curriculum, which creates themes within the, anything that they teach your kids even a math problem in which they can speak to ideological political agendas and it's also critical race theory so through all of these things uh, and there's the graphic it's propping up a marxist pedagogy in our schools and the reason that kids are learning to hate their country is because their school is teaching them that through multiple ideologies and agendas that prop up a Marxist pedagogy. And by pedagogy, I mean the whole of the teaching is pedagogy. And this goes from kindergarten through the 12th grade and then only intensifies in college. And so our kids are being taught poorly, I might add, to read and write and do math through a Marxist worldview. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the Marxist worldview? It is distinctly anti-religion, anti-family, anti-capitalism, anti-America, and then we wonder why our kids end up in this way. So at the, and at the end of the day, they even don't read, write, and do math very well because the teachers and the institutions are really prioritizing this ideology and the Marxist teachings over actual reading and writing because they're seeking to make emotional activists and um, soldiers for the cause more than logic, you know, and reasoning and thinking individuals that will steward our country forward. Robin, how long do we think this has been going on for the little kids? Obviously, it was COVID that brought that into everyone's living room and woke people up as the, the filth they're pouring on our kids. How long were they pouring that filth on our third graders before we woke up to it? This has been percolating for decades. Um, the dismantling started, I think, really in the early part of, you know, like the 40s into 50s and 60s. And then there was a book written by Herbert Marcuse, who was part of the Frankfurt School, who really brought critical theory, which is the 
parent of critical race theory and also critical queer theory and all of the critical theories swirling around our children's head. He wrote a paper in the 70s that said, you know what, overt revolution is not really working for us. So it's time to go into the teaching institutions, to the universities, to the corporations and start working that way in order to affect change. And that's really what they did. So there was a definite shift in the early 70s in which they went into the academia. And then, so that was percolating for a while. And then the DOE, Department of Education, was formed in the late 70s. That gave it a kickstart. But really, when we trace back all of these ideologies, when they intensely came into the school system, was in the Obama administration. That is when a lot of the, them received the direct injection into the bloodstream of American education, and it really took off exponentially at that point. That's social emotional learning, critical race theory, comprehensive sexuality education, and even the issue of pornographic content in the libraries. From 2020, there were only 600 reported obscene books, and then in 2021, 1,600. So it's just been going at an exponential pace and parents are drinking from a fire hose trying to keep up. There's just so many things in the war for our children. There are many, many battlefronts. And so that graphic I showed you earlier, the columns that prop up the Marxist pedagogy, those are also really the battlefronts that parents must engage on to get informed and equipped so that they can advocate for their kid and defend them against all of this. Because as those pillars ideally start to crumble, and, and we see that happening a lot with gender ideology right now. The, uh, the trans activists are really losing that fight, and, and that's how you start to crumble the whole thing. It's just by knocking out those pillars and being informed and aware and advocate for your child. And this is another graphic that we made. When people ask me, is gender ideology in my schools? And I created this graphic. I put over 60 hours of research into it but from the international level down to the county level in Tennessee, these are all the entities that are directly targeting your child's school. So the answer is, is gender right. ideology in my child's classroom 100% yes. It would be very statistically slim odds that it would not be. Why the sex gender stuff, as icky as all that is to talk about, but when it comes to kids, how does that help make them little communists? Because it's destabilizing to the family. And, you know, if you sexualize a child, then you're essentially destroying a family before it even starts. And, and you also, you don't set the child up for success in life. And so in this past year, when you think about the war for our kids, and all the battlefronts that parents must worry about. And if you start listing out to the average parent, well, you gotta know about critical race theory, social emotional learning, comprehensive sex ed, um, all the generative curriculum, all of the things that parents just get a far away look and they start to glaze over and they're ready to give up right then and there. So what we did as a chapter is we took each ideology and focused on it one month per ideology so that we could just break it down into more digestible bite-sized portions and present it to the parents so that then they can understand these issues because in order to advocate or fight back on an issue, you must understand it. So in March, we focused on the pornographic content in the libraries. And it turns out that, you know what? Porn addiction is up amongst our youth. It is, when you put porn in front of a child in the library, it's really a gateway drug to a life of addiction to that kind of content. And this does not yield healthy relationships. And Marxism, so what does the Marxist worldview say? It's anti-family. It actually despises the family unit. How do you destroy the family? You sexualize the kids. That's just one way to do it. Yeah. Robin, love you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. All right, I have some final thoughts. Next. Patriotism isn't some hokey word. It's not some overused cliche. It is really, really important for the nation. And we are losing it. 
We're losing it quickly. And we have to keep this in mind. This is being done on purpose. The evil system we have, the evil institutions we have now, they are taking away the patriotism of this nation on purpose. So we will allow them to burn it down. That is their ultimate goal. They want to burn it down. They know we won't let them while we love it. So they're trying to make us hate it. Remember, it's being done on purpose. All right? All right. We'll do it again.